John T. Claypole's words fail us in defence of disfluency, published this January 2021, is a book written by someone who stammers about speech disorders. Not just stammering, although Claypole prefers to use stutter, but also aphasia, the dysthyria that may be experienced by people with a range of conditions, such as cerebral palsy, Parkinson's or motor neuron disease, as well as the vocal sticks, ticks associated with Tourette's. The title of the book, referring most obviously to disordered speech, but also, as becomes apparent from reading through the chapters, it is also about how the language which is used around fluency and disordered speech fails us, perhaps more than disfluent speech ever does. The subtitle gives the reader an indication that Claypole intends to defend disfluent speech, and he does this in multiple ways. Questioning the cultural definitions of disordered speech, exploring the productivity and benefits that can and do arise from disordered speech, and finally, through a call to be active in defending our disfluent speech. And so, responding to this call, I'm making this video relying on my disfluent speech rather than a conventional written review. Claypole takes the reader through 11 chapters, bookended by an introduction, The King and I, introducing us to the key ideas of the book through a discussion on efforts to make King George VI speech fluent for radio, and of a very personal epilogue, Out of the Mouth Trap. The book is a journey through speech disorders, considering how speech disorders are culturally defined, but also contrasting this with the concept of hyperfluency. Fluency, and increasingly hyperfluency, is expected in a range of situations such as presentations or interviews, for example. Fluency is attractive, seductive even, in its power to convince or persuade. But of course, as Claypole reminds, the hyperfluent can be charlatans, and hyperfluency can conceal an absence of content. I suggest that neither of these are desirable. Claypole's message is that fluency can be tyrannical, and we should resist it. He explores the history of speech and language therapy drawing on his own experiences of therapy, most recently through the City Lit, and how the, this speech therapy, based on the principles of desensitisation and stammering more fluently, rather than an attempt to conceal and eradicate disfluency, has been life-changing. He also presents a case for aligning speech disorders to the neurodiversity movement. It seems compelling, enabling greater acceptance of the diversity of speech and realising the potential to contribute to a more empathetic, linguistically innovative and communicative society. The final chapters are a call to arms to those with speech disorders to use their speech as an act of resistance. We must stop conce concealing our disordered speech and certainly stop apologising for it.